Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Thursday, the nine o'clock block. Uh, Ron Flagg, the president of the Legal Services Corporation uh, on the mainland, joins us. Uh, welcome to the show, Ron. Thanks, Jay. It's good to be with you. I, I wish I was really with you because uh, I think uh, we'd I'd be I'd be more comfortable uh, uh, wearing uh, Aloha wear and enjoying uh, the weather there. But I, I'm happy. To you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for um, not wearing Aloha wear, leaving it to me. Um, maybe next time you can wear Aloha wear. Excellent. <laughs> so, Ron, you're the president of the Legal Services Corporation. What, what is that, and where is it, and what does it do? So, uh, Legal Services Corporation is the largest funder of civil legal aid in America. What's civil legal aid? When people, low-income people, have problems, uh, uh, housing problems, maybe they're going to be evicted, maybe they are uh, 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 victims or potential victims of domestic violence, uh, they have uh, family law issues, they have custody issues, a grandparent uh, may need to get custody of a grandchild, uh, maybe they have uh, debt collectors after them, maybe they're veterans and uh, they're owed uh, benefits uh, from the VA, those sorts of problems. Uh, need help, and uh, uh, LSC is the largest funder of civil legal aid in America. We fund legal aid programs, in, including the Hawaii uh, Legal Aid Society, across the entire country. Uh, we're funded by Congress, and then we grant out the money. And then the other thing we do is try to uh, uh, identify um, innovations, help practices for all of the programs we fund and uh, to consider uh, to help help them in, in providing services uh, better and more efficiently. Well, how did you get into this? Uh, this is not uh, an ordinary legal type of job, is it? Uh, how, how did you wend your life into it? No, it's, uh, again, the, the people we fund are doing the legal work. Uh, uh, Hawaii Legal, uh, uh, legal Aid Society has dozens of lawyers who help uh, low-income Hawaiians with the kind of civil legal problems I described. LSC, the organization that uh, I'm the president of and work with in Washington, provide fundings to these uh, legal aid organizations across the country. So is it a government agency? Uh, no, we're a private nonprofit, but we get 99% of our funding from Congress and the amount of money we have available to provide in Hawaii and uh, the other 49 states and the territories is dependent on how much money uh, Congress gives us. So, um, you know, COVID has affected everyone. And, you know, we have yet to learn all of the effects that it has had on our institutions, our society, our people. Um, how has it affected LSC? How has it affected legal aid in general around the country? So let's take a, I mean, the short answer is it's made a bad situation worse. It's made a challenging situation worse. Um, let's go back to the good old days prior to the pandemic. Uh, in the good old days, uh, a study that LSC did uh, a few years back showed that 86% of the problems faced by low income Americans were met with either no assistance or inadequate assistance. That was before the pandemic. Uh, since the pandemic, we've had obviously uh, a spike in unemployment. It's gotten a little better, but it's still well above pre-pandemic levels. That means more people qualify for uh, the legal aid that uh, LSC funds. And the people uh, who qualify for legal aid are seeing surges in things like evictions or at least potential evictions in uh, domestic violence. They really have a perfect storm for domestic violence. You have uh, great economic stress, you have great health stress, and uh, the pandemic requires or, or puts limitations on people's ability to move out of their homes. So you put those together and inevitably, unfortunately, you get a increase in domestic violence. Uh, you know, family issues, uh, a whole host of issues have got that were bad before the pandemic have gotten worse. 
When you say it got worse, what's the dynamic? We have two years of experience here under our belt. Um, you know, the first year there was a sort of blush about it, and the second year it sort of settles in on you, uh, us. And I wonder, um, you know, has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? It is the same between the year one and year two. Yeah, it, it, it really varies across jurisdictions and across problems. Um, let me just address two different areas, uh, domestic violence and, um, and then evictions, which are prevalent across the country. Um, domestic violence, if you look at the statistics for 2020, um, in a lot of instances, uh, we weren't in the statistics that is the reported cases or the reports to uh, police and other law enforcement, uh, there didn't seem necessarily to be an increase in domestic violence. But what actually was happening on the ground was uh, that there were increases in domestic violence, but people weren't reporting them because they were you know, stuck at home with, with uh, uh, the perpetrator of the violence. In 2021, uh, the communications has gotten better and the reports of domestic violence have caught up with what's actually happening on the ground. And we're seeing in many instances, multiple two or three times uh, the uh, number of domestic violence incidents that we saw prior to the pandemic that has not abated. That's only gotten worse. Uh, events has had a very, uh, uh, kind of up and down run because people, so many people lost their jobs at the outset of the pandemic and lawmakers recognize that, oh my gosh, if everybody who lost their job also loses their homes and are forced to live with friends or families or in homeless shelters, that would be a bad thing during a pandemic. All, that would not only be a housing disaster, it would be a health disaster. So what happened is we've had both state and local governments and then the federal government, the Center for Disease Control, uh, establish these eviction moratoria, which put a pause on evictions so that we weren't throwing people out of homes during the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and so throughout uh, 2020 and through 2021, through around September, the level of evictions uh, was well below the, the level of evictions prior to the pandemic. The concern about evictions was very high because people were uh, six months, 12 months, 18 months behind in their rental payments. They'd lost their jobs, uh, didn't have a means to pay uh, landlords, you know, many of them. Uh, you know, small, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, wealthy themselves, had mortgages to pay and they, they weren't collecting rents. Uh, so the, the federal government uh, has provided um, $46 billion in emergency rental assistance, uh, which was intended to get into the hands of tenants and ultimately landlords so that tenants didn't lose their homes uh, landlords didn't lose, uh, you know, their homes and, and the, uh, uh, the buildings that they were operating. Uh, there were, it, it took a long while for the uh, uh, emergency rental assistance across the country to get out. These were basically operations state to state, uh, sometimes uh, area to area. It didn't exist. And all of a sudden we have collectively billions of dollars going out that needs to be distributed to landlords and tenants. And it took a while to get that up and running, uh, but it has gotten up and running. Uh, and so again, through most of 2021, we've seen eviction rates stay below the levels they were prior to the pandemic. The Center for Disease Control uh, moratorium uh, terminated in September of this year. Uh, most of the state and local moratoria have also ended. A few states uh, have continued to have moratorium, um, but the rental assistance is helping keep down the level of evictions. They're still below pre-pandemic levels, but they're creeping up because there's now not a, um, a moratorium in existence in most places. And so we're seeing eviction cases go up. The real fear is 
the money is running out. The emergency rental assistance was for 12 or 18 months. Well, we're now, you know, 18 months into the pandemic or, uh, you know, nearing two years come uh, early next year. And so the real, you know, question is what's going to happen when that money uh, runs out? And uh, uh, that's the great concern. Well, it strikes me that, um, you know, you're a kind of executive who needs to read the paper closely every day because what's happening in our community, our national community, affects the need for services by legal aid societies around the country. And you have to anticipate, based on what is happening on the ground, um, what, is, what is happening in those legal aid societies. That's exactly. And I don't know how you can tune it up. Can you change the way you distribute your funding to meet the problems in different areas and cities and regions? Uh, actually, uh, surprisingly, no. Uh, uh, in large measure, no. The funding we get from Congress, uh, the great bulk of it, I'd say 90% of it goes out uh, under a formula. And the formula is pretty simple. Uh, uh, you get from the Census Bureau the percentage of people in each service area who uh, who's come is 120% or less uh, than the poverty level. Uh, in the uh, 48 of the continental United States, the poverty level that enables you to get uh, uh, legal aid is for a, a, a one-person household just uh, uh, sixteen thousand dollars, and four-person household, it's uh, thirty-two thousand dollars. And asking why uh, those numbers are a little bit higher, not much higher, a little bit higher. So you have to be quite uh, uh, poor, really, to qualify for legal aid. But our money goes out under that formula. So if uh, a state has uh, or a service area, say if Hawaii had 1% of the uh, people living in poverty in the United States, uh, then Hawaii Legal uh, Aid Society's share of our funding would be 1%. We have no discretion. That's the, what, what uh, Hawaii Legal Aid Society would get. The only way for Hawaii Legal Aid Society to get more from LSC is for Congress to increase our overall appropriation. Wow, that is um, that is really interesting. Because let me ask you this: If you had your druthers, Ron, if you had discretion in a in a in a very what do you want to call it dynamic, challenging time, uh, such the time that we live in, uh, where different areas have different problems, and then they may change. I mean, the the numbers on COVID, for example, change, and and there's got to be a correlation between COVID. Uh, domestic violence, uh, the need for legal assistance, civil legal assistance, and, and so forth. How would you change the formula if you could? Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't be in a rush to change it because I'm not sure we could come up with anything better than that. When we got uh, $50 million in COVID uh, emergency funding in March of 2020, and uh, Remember, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, we, we all know how things within a week or two changed dramatically during the pandemic. So when we got this funding, uh, you'll, re you'll recall Washington state had uh, really high uh, cases and mortalities. New York City had unbelievably high mortality rates uh, and high case rates. So we got this first $50 million we uh, granted out pretty much in equal amounts to all of our funding recipients, uh, relatively small grants in the range of $25,000 to help them get up and running remotely. So if they needed uh, laptops and uh, cell phones so that their lawyers could work from home, they were able to purchase that. But the bulk of the money, the $46 million was largely distributed based on population, but we made an adjustment to the population based on the uh, COVID cases that uh, were occurring at the time of our grants. Well, it turned out, and, and we did that, and uh, 
you know, had, had we granted out the money three months later or six months later, that adjustment factor would have been very different because lo and behold, uh, rates in New York were still high, but they came down a bit. You know, rates in Washington state were still high, but they came down a bit. Places like Texas and the South, which had uh, very low rates at the outset of the pandemic, you know, had peaks in their, in their rates. So um, our funding is, is there for the long, the long run. And, uh, you know, just as you suggested in your question, uh, the conditions of the pandemic have changed so rapidly. And one place that seems uh, immune from the pandemic uh, for a week or two, the next week is, is, is really in a bad place. And places that were really suffering terribly uh, earlier, you know, are relatively better off. As, as any granting agency, I'm sure you require reports to come back so yeah. you can um, you you can know and you can analyze uh, how the money is being spent by every grantee in every state. Yes. Um, so you know where where does it go? Um, does it go to you mentioned earlier maybe equipment, um, maybe salaries, maybe rent? Uh, where does it go, and how have those proportions changed in terms of the way the various legal aid societies in the country are spending it? Well, it, it by and large, I think for any organization, uh, there, there are two major expense categories, uh, human beings and uh, rent. And uh, that's also true for legal aid. And uh, LSC's funding by and large is for operational expenses. So these uh, formula grants enable uh, our uh, legal aid programs that we fund to operate, and so they can be used for uh, any reasonable costs of, of, uh, of lawyers and staff, or rent, or other expenses, including technology. Uh, the pandemic really hasn't changed that too much. That the <laughs> rent didn't go up. In fact, the buildings weren't being used by and large, but they still had to pay rent. Uh, with the influx of funding from uh, LSC. Many of our programs were able to uh, uh, hire more lawyers and other staff to help out with the increases in cases. Uh, before the pandemic, the uh, three or four leading categories of cases were housing, family law, uh, consumer issues. Those were three, really the three biggest, uh, housing and family law across all of our programs account for about 60% of the cases. I think during the pandemic, they still accounted for over 60% of the cases, probably housing creeping up a little bit higher than the pandemic because the loss of jobs lead to the uh, potential for evictions and other housing problems. It strikes me that, um, you know, we have had, um, according to the newspapers, the great resignation there, there is, um, what do you want to call it, disturbances in the labor market, and that would include the professional labor market. I imagine some um, civil law firms uh, have um, dispatched uh, lawyers because they didn't have the work. Um, some, um, some government agencies probably too. And, and the question is, how is the market for lawyers who might be hired or might be terminated um, by legal aid societies. Is it harder for legal aid societies to hire new staff? I mean, professional staff? Is it uh, easier? Um, how, how have the numbers of lawyers in those organizations changed in the course of COVID? Well, a couple of things there, Jay. Uh, first of all, um, because our funding has, has uh, you know, remained steady and we even got an, a, 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 a relatively small influx of money uh, at the outset of the pandemic, our funding recipients have been able to retain their staff. They had the money to retain their staff. They didn't have to, I'm not aware of any of them laying off staff during the pandemic. Um, in terms of resignations, most legal aid lawyers are pretty much the lowest paid uh, lawyers in America. They're paid less than government lawyers, 
they're often paid less than public defenders. Uh, they make less, far less than people in, in law firms. Uh, so they're doing it, uh, obviously they're doing it for the money in the sense that they have to uh, uh, keep themselves and their families fed and, and clothed and housed, but they're doing it, they're mission-based. They're, they're, they're doing it because they believe in the mission, they believe in the value of justice and making sure that people of all income levels get justice. So um, I don't certainly at LSC and as best I can tell uh, within our grantees, we have not seen the level of, of resignations that we've seen across other sectors. Uh, if you're in it for the money, um, you know, you might conclude, gee, uh, it's not worth the money anymore. If you're in it because you want to help people in need and those needs have gotten bigger, you're not going to leave. Yeah, I would imagine that um, a lot of them have doubled down on that mission. They've seen the strife uh, in the lives of their clientele, and um, they're even more dedicated, uh, having seen that now in the time of COVID. I, I, if, if I were there doing that, that's what I would, that would be my reaction. As long as I could make it work on my own, you know, my own life, with sufficient funds to live my same life, I would not only stay, but I would be more active, more dedicated than before. Do you see signs of that? I guess you do. Yeah, no, again, at LSC, we've, that's exactly been the case. Uh, I, it, it, there's sort of a lag between what happens at, in, our, in the legal aid programs we fund and our learning of what happens. But I think by and large, people are staying with, with this caveat. All of us, all of us, every single one of us have faced uh, increased and in many cases enormous stress as a result of the pandemic. Uh, those of us, and for me, that would, would have been a few years ago, but those of us who have uh, uh, school age kids trying to uh, uh, help their kids with uh, uh, distant education or maybe had family members we had to take care of during the pandemic, uh, whether it was elder care, self care. Um, you know, that created a lot of stress and, um, you know, certainly uh, the combination of that stress and the burnout, you know, we, we see a, a ER workers who are certainly dedicated and mission oriented who are, you know, burning out. I think on occasion you'll see among uh, uh, civil legal aid lawyers, but with that caveat, uh, you know, I, I don't believe we've witnessed uh, a large exodus from the civil delayed uh, core. You know, it strikes me that, as I said before, you know, everything is changing around us, and including the institutions, and it strikes me that going forward, uh, we're, we're not going to ever get back to what we, what we think might be normal, but uh, on the other side, the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, I think it's going to be revealed that Legal, uh, legal uh, uh, Services Corporation is more important to our society, more important to those particular elements um, of our demographics than it was before. People will take note, perhaps, um, by what you are doing now um, on the other side. Do you think there's a chance of that? Yeah, there, there, there has certainly been uh, many silver linings from the pandemic, but one benefit, if you want to call it that, is people are far more aware of civil legal issues and civil legal aid in 2021 than they were in 2019. Issues like evictions, unemployment, uh, and domestic violence, which in 2019, somebody else's problem and you know nobody paid much attention to them, now are our front page issues. Uh, uh, the, the possibility of five or 10 or 15 or 20 million people being thrown out of homes, that's, a, uh, that's an intention grabber. And so we've gotten a lot more attention from the media, uh, from uh, political leaders uh, than we have before. So I think there is a chance that following the pandemic, that attention to those substantive issues of housing, employment, uh, family law issues, uh, you know, my hope is it's, uh, we're not going to, we're not going to, uh, uh, you know, our attention span is not going to be too short. Yeah, uh, 
a mixed blessing, but it is a blessing for LSC. <clears throat> okay, we have to get to uh, Hawaii now for a minute. Um, you gave a couple of grants to the Legal Aid Society in Hawaii, and my recollection of the newspaper article was that these grants uh, had an effect on, on technology, uh, as you mentioned earlier. Can you talk about the size of those grants uh, and the technology involved? Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to. So uh, LSC has a program uh, where we grant out about $4 million a year uh, throughout the country to the programs uh, that we fund generally. And Legal Aid Society in Hawaii uh, is receiving two grants uh, in the coming year. It's going to receive a $93,000 grant to support uh, a program called Legal Navigator, which employs artificial intelligence and other uh, cutting edge technologies to help states guide low income individuals to really the best form of legal systems is available. And the grant will enable a legal aid society to develop and maintain legal navigator uh, for the long term. And it will also create uh, ways for new states and partners to use uh, legal navigator. So that was one grant. And then a separate grant. Before you go to that, what, what exactly does navigator do? So uh, imagine uh, you need help and you, you, you go to the internet and you Google um, uh, losing my home or you Google uh, my spouse is hitting me or you Google um, uh, I've lost my job. Uh, Legal Navigator is meant to uh, recognize that as a potential legal problem and then ask you questions to flesh out you know things about you where you live uh what your income is the nature of your problem and then direct you to a resource that can help you either a human resource that can provide assistance or a self-help tool it might uh lead you to uh, a tool sort of like TurboTax will ask you, uh, what's your name? My name is Jay. Uh, Jay, what can I do for you today? Uh, I've, I've lost my job. Uh, you know, where did you work? How much money did you make? When did you lose your job? How long did you work there? Uh, and then, you know, here's the, here's the form uh, you need to fill out and it'll help you fill it out. So that in its most ambitious form is how Legal Navigator is designed to work. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good because it saves staff time and it gives you, uh, that is the client, an accurate direction about uh, where to go. And it, of course, it gathers the data that can be used by the lawyer later. Exactly. So what about the second grant? So the second grant, uh, Legal Aid Society will use, and it's about $76,000, to redesign its case intake system uh, to really better use technology to ensure that intake is accessible to eligible residents. If you go back in time, uh, you know, a number of years ago, most legal programs, if you wanted to get help, you had to go walk into their office and, you know, stand in line and talk to somebody or maybe, you know, call them on the telephone and, you know, annoyingly listen to music for uh, a long period of time, and then they would ask you a bunch of questions. So most intake systems now uh, are designed uh, to, to be more user friendly and to use technology to expedite that system. For example, uh, our programs help people with civil cases, not uh, criminal cases. So if you had an automated system and one of the questions the automated system asked right up front would be you know do you have a civil or a criminal uh, problem and if you said criminal it would say automatically sorry we can't help you uh, here's the public defender or, or, or the other resource that could help you with that problem and we we wouldn't use a civil legal aid staff member to uh, to direct you and um, anyway, so this uh, grant will help uh, the uh, Legal Aid Society with its intake. 
You know, uh, Think Tech Hawaii, our organization, has changed its way of doing business over the past couple of years. Um, we have a studio, but we don't use the studio. We use Zoom just like this. And uh, on the one hand, we've, uh, you know, we don't have the high res higher resolution that we would have in the studio. But on the other hand, we can reach all across the world, including you, Ron, uh, and talk to you. And people respond to us. And, it, you know, it has had a permanent effect on the way we see our mission, the accomplishment of our mission. And um, I, I can tell you, I know a lot of lawyers and law firm managers where the same kind of thing has happened. It's not total, not 100%. Uh, there are, yes, there are person-to-person -person meetings, of course, and, you know, you have so forth. Um, however, um, as we come out the other side, hopefully soon, um, you know, their lives, their professional lives will be different. And I imagine that the professional lives of the lawyers in the legal aid societies around the country would be different. Have you observed that? Is that a side effect of these technology grants uh, that they're using Zoom or other such products in order to um, make their connection with people more efficient? Absolutely. I mean, again, it, it, it cuts a lot of a lot of ways. I mean, uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, legal aid programs would do outreach to potential clients by, uh, you know, posting uh, flyers in churches and community uh, centers and, uh, um, and, you know, reaching out to people in person and, and inviting people in their offices. Uh, you know, for a long period of time, churches weren't meeting, uh, people weren't able to go to community centers, uh, the physical offices of legal programs were often closed. So we had to come up with different means of outreach, social media. Uh, uh, now all of a sudden people are, are hearing about programs and can uh, watch programs on the internet, on Facebook, uh, other social media, uh, meetings that used to be face-to-face. Uh, can be face to face, but uh, where clients have wherewithal uh, on their phones, or if they can get access to a, a computer, uh, you know they they can meet, and that's a very powerful potential tool. And it was pre-pandemic. Uh, if you look at a place like Hawaii, that certainly has uh, uh, urban centers, uh, but then has population dispersed across uh, multiple islands, uh, or you know, a place like Alaska or Montana, where uh, the population is, is very dispersed and the, the lawyers are concentrated in a few cities, you know, the challenge is how do you serve somebody who's uh, uh, an island away or, uh, you know, uh, 500 miles away in, you know, Alaska or a thousand miles away in Alaska, Montana? You, you need to come up with ways of uh, of, of overcoming, uh, you know, the digital divide, getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, providing them access uh, to uh, technology tools that will enable them to communicate with lawyers who might not be physically proximate uh, to the, the clients. Uh, you know, healthcare faces the same challenges, but it, healthcare has actually done a bit a, a better job. You know, you find uh, health clinics in a lot of remote areas. You don't find law offices in remote areas. So, um, you know, one one thing to do is is put a kiosk in those uh, healthcare clinics you know, where they could they uh, communicate with a lawyer that you know was located somewhere else. Mm. Very interesting as well. And do you, do you feel that Hawaii is a place that has a special need for technology grants? I mean, what what were the alternatives? Uh, what would the alternatives be um, in lieu of giving Hawaii technology grants? Well, again, uh, you know, I, I, I think in terms of the, the legal navigator tool, that's not unique to Hawaii. Every jurisdiction, people in poverty or, or not, everyone in every jurisdiction that has legal problems and doesn't have uh, the financial wherewithal to hire a lawyer at, you know, $100, $200, $500 an hour to help them, uh, it goes to the internet and, and you know, tries to, to uh, figure out where they can get help. So we need tools like Legal Navigator to help 
uh, direct people to the right resources, and that, that's not that's for everybody in the country, every legal yeah, aid that's society. That's not unique to Hawaii. Uh, the intake system that uh, uh, Legal Aid Society is going to use its technology grant for, again, is not unique to Hawaii in the sense that every legal aid program has to come up with a way to reach out to potential clients and to communicate with them and understand what their needs are and figure out whether they can serve those needs. I think, you know, something that Hawaii uh, has to face, which many states do, but not all of our legal aid programs do, is the, the dispersity of, of the population where, you know, you do have people living in smaller towns and, and uh, villages, uh, you know, away from population centers. And, uh, you know, those folks have uh, civil legal problems like everybody else. And the question is how to get them service. And technology can play a role there. Again, that's not unique to Hawaii. Uh, you would face similar issues in Montana or Alaska or Texas or you know any part of the United States where um, there's a, a geographic dispersity. We have um, some programs, for example, we have a program in Cleveland or New York City, or we have program a program in Los Angeles. Obviously, there population dispersity is not an issue, uh, but uh, certainly the programs that, that uh, serve uh, dispersed areas, rural areas, uh, including Hawaii, face those challenges. Well, it sounds like these um, technology grants raise all the boats, um, and it's, um, it's, it's something the whole country could use and is using now, or will use by virtue of grants like this. Yeah. And, 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 uh, go ahead. It's really critical because, again, uh, the amount of money that Congress appropriates to LSC is not nearly enough. I mentioned at the outset of the program, 86% of the pro legal problems faced by low-income Americans are, are uh, responding with no assistance or inadequate assistance. So the question is, how do we leverage this relatively small number of legal aid lawyers and staff? How do we make their numbers bigger in addition to just hiring more. And one way is to make their work more efficient with technology. One way is to enable them to reach, you know, rather than uh, having somebody in a remote town that is a live lawyer in a remote town, there maybe there are only uh, 100 people. Uh, uh, we, you know, can't, you know, none of our programs are able to uh, have an office in towns of a few thousand people or a few hundred people. So how do you reach those folks? And uh, you can do it, you know, technology can help. Uh, technology can provide the kind of interactive tool that we were talking about, the sort of TurboTax tool that will help you fill out a, a form. Um, you know, it may not be as good as having a live lawyer, but it's better than having no help at all, which is often the alternative. Leverage, that's what it is, leverage. That's what we're talking about. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, Ron, and I wanted to ask you one last three-part question. <laughs> I'll object as compound, but go ahead. Well, this is really relatively sub subjective. <laughs> so, um, so, Ron, how long have you been with LSC? How long do you plan to be with LSC? Am I right in, and my third part is, am I right in concluding it's the same sort of psychic benefit that, that holds lawyers to legal aid societies around the country applies to you. Absolutely. Yeah, well, the, the, the answer to the last question is absolutely. Jay, all of us, all of us during the pandemic have felt helpless at times. Uh, we felt helpless vis-a-vis -vis our own health, the health of our family and friends and loved ones. We felt helpless about lots of things. And to be in a job where uh, every day, at least at times, I feel like I'm being helpful, <laughs> that is a blessing beyond measure. And so that's been terrific. I've been at uh, LSC for eight years. I was uh, the general counsel for the uh, uh, first uh, six and a half. And for the last uh, 20 months, I've been president. And uh, as I say, I, I have found being here to, particularly during the pandemic, to be an absolute blessing. Thank you, Ron Flagg, President of LSC, Legal Services Corporation in Washington, D.C. 
which funds our legal society, the Legal Aid Society, with technology grants and other grants. Thank you so much, Ron. Thanks, Jay. Stay well. Aloha.